Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Towards Data Science podcast for what I thought was one of the funnest episodes we've done yet. I spoke to Ken Stanley, who among other things is a former startup founder and AI researcher, both in academia and at Uber AI Labs, and then most recently at OpenAI, where he leads the open-ended learning team. Now in 2015, Ken and his co-author Joel Lehman wrote a book called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, The Myth of the Objective. And it was written for general audiences, but it's about a series of insights from their research work that has major implications both for AI system design and for the way people think about goal setting in their everyday lives. The book essentially makes the case for moving away from the focus on objective functions and towards more open-ended approaches to learning. Now, if you follow the podcast, you know that I'm not in the habit of recommending books, but today as open-endedness is really starting to take off and show potential as a key ingredient on the road to AGI, I think it's a book worth picking up. Now, Ken joined me to talk about it, what open-endedness could mean for humanity, the future of intelligence, and even AI safety on this episode of the Towards Data Science Podcast. I'm really excited to have you. This is a conversation I've been looking forward to for quite some time now. I think a big part of this is going to have to do with talking about intelligence and whether it can be defined, what it might mean, what processes generate it, and what maybe what kinds of intelligences we might be stuck with if we don't change our thinking about this stuff. So maybe I'll open with a very general question. How do you think of intelligence? Like, what is intelligence to you? Yeah, so I think intelligence encompasses a whole range of different phenomena. Um, and, and I don't Actually, I'm not completely sure um, what all of them are, um, and it, it's an endless source of debate. Um, but um, what I kind of get enamored with are the sides of intelligence that are sort of like really deep in what it means to be human, I guess, um, or the ones that move us emotionally. Um, so that seems like things like um, creativity um, or self-expression, um, which are like at the heart of the story of humanity, like, you know, the, the whole history of civilization is a history of like vast creativity. And there's these other things that we do, like we do calculations, we do analysis, um, we can we can remember facts, we can control things. Um, and th those are very important, but that's not the side of it that um, really amazes me and, and, and captivates me. It's really this, this creative open-ended side of it. Um, and I feel like that side of intelligence doesn't get as much, um, or hasn't at least historically gotten as much attention um, when we talk about AI. Think of it more sort of in the robotic sense, um, but you know, I'm thinking of it in terms of like the more deeply human sense. It also seems to be one of the hardest aspects of intelligence to evaluate as well, right? Like, I mean, I'm thinking here when we look at classical use of AI, you know, vision, classification, things like that, you can say, oh, well, you, you know, your AI performed to X percent accuracy or, or, or you know, an entropy of Y. Um, whereas these kind of creative things are a bit different. Can you speak a little bit to, to how, that, how that plays into your thinking about intelligence? What's the difference between those things? Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt. Um, it's a good point that the creative side of intelligence um, is, is hard to evaluate. Like in the sense that how do you know if you created some artificial um, neural network or something like that, whether it's good at being creative? Um, the, I mean, the problem with creativity is that it's basically about producing things or generating things that we didn't anticipate. I mean, if we did anticipate them, they're sort of like not creative by definition. So if you're trying to make something that will make things that you don't anticipate, then you don't really have an objective ground truth evaluation for it. You don't know what you're evaluating it against because you don't know what to expect. So if you're getting unexpected things, then how do you say whether it's doing a good job? And it, it, the problem is it, it brings up this issue of subjectivity um, because there's a sort of like, there's a subjective aspect to creativity. It's like, well, do, do I like it? Is it interesting? Um, that's how I generally evaluate creativity. Like if you give me a story, um, th there's no objective way to say it, it is or it isn't good or here's what the score is on a scale of one to a hundred. Um, just how do I feel about that? Um, and even things like, um, it's not that you may think, well, there are, there's a side to creativity that's objective, like there's science and there's math, and like you can write a proof and it's either true or it's not true and things like that. It's true though, that the, that the, the truth of the proof is, is actually a matter of objective fact, but what is still subjective is whether that's interesting, you know, is that worth proving? Like, should you go down that route? 
And I think when you're evaluating creativity, those questions have to be confronted. You, you can't just say, well, did you create something that's correct? Because who cares if nobody would really want it or use it or do anything with it or build on it? Um, and so with this kind of research, you're, you're grappling with um, ultimately something related to subjectivity, but trying to do it in as principled a way as to make it actually possibly algorithmic. That definitely is a question I think most people will have is, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, I, I buy the argument that objective functions maybe pin us down to a, a subset of algorithms that are maybe too myopic, too, um, not, not that they're too narrowly capable, but they're not somehow exploratory enough. How do we break through that paradigm? Like, what is our option other than to set an objective and then have an agent or a neural network execute against that objective? Yeah, yeah, and this has been a big subject of my research over time is, is thinking about that question. Um, and, and it's important to, to consider also that like when you talk about objective versus subjective, that, that saying like, okay, um, when, when machine learning, usually we, we, we think about things in terms of setting objective, like try to um, defeat this player in this game, say like checkers or chess or, or go or something like that. And that's an objective. And then we can measure progress against that objective. Um, and, and that that can be seen as objective. Um, now subjective is like, okay, it produced like a picture, like is it good or is it not good? But there's another, there's another issue though with respect to objectives, which isn't the, the, the dichotomy of subjective objective. There's also this issue of, should I even be setting objectives in the first place if I'm trying to actually do something interesting? Um, and this is, this is related to, to, to the question of like, well, how do we actually pursue things like that in, in like an algorithmic way? Um, because like, if you're interested in discovery, it might actually be against your interest to have an objective that you're moving towards. Now, I mean, I, you might want to discover time travel. I mean, that, that would be definitely cool. Like we would like that if you would do that, but, but the problem is that that's unrealistic. Um, and there's basically no gradient. We don't really know how to move in that direction. So probably you're going to be moving to a dead end or something that's not very productive. And it might have been better to use your time not having like this preconceived notion of where you're trying to go and instead just try to go somewhere interesting. Um, and interesting could also just generally also encompass the idea of novelty. And some people know novelty search, which I worked on like a long time ago with Joe Lehman. Um, and so often like when you think about what is interesting, it's, it's, it's it, not just often, it's always something novel, but it's more than just something novel. It's, it's novel and also something else. Um, and when we try to move towards interestingness, it's not like moving towards an objective um, because we don't know where we're going. Um, and it's more like you're saying, do the pieces that I've accumulated here potentially lead somewhere interesting without knowing what that thing is? Um, and I actually think we are very good at that as human beings. That's actually one of our great talents. That's why we're so creative. Um, and that's why it's kind of interesting that we don't, we haven't put as much effort into formalizing that notion, um, like in terms of artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, it's not that we haven't put any, I mean, we talk, we talk about things like intrinsic motivation, which is a related idea and, and novelty and things like that. But still like as, a, as the lion's share of our research is almost entirely on sort of like reaching for specific well-defined explicit objectives um, and not this idea of like pursuing the interesting even though it's undefined and I'm not sure where I'm going and this is like having a nose for the interesting it's just an amazing human characteristic that we can do that um, and if we want AI to have great ideas uh, we're gonna have to I think capture that notion more formally. Reading your book I think one of the the big take-homes is that the sort of story of human discovery and human understanding can be told as the story of a kind of frontier of stuff we understand, and then some very some ideas that are very close to that frontier that somebody realizes, oh hey, you know, like I just I can now see it clearly enough now that that I've done all this random exploration or just kind of looking at, at what's interesting. Eventually, you go down a path you don't know what you're looking for, and then you spot something. You're like, hey, that looks cool. Like Thomas Edison had everything he needed to discover the light to invent the light bulb, and then he does it. But that, that objective setting mode is kind of the final step of the process. Is, is, was that a fair characterization? Yeah, that's fair. And that's like, I've tried to kind of um, reformulate this story of like the great inventor or the great discoverer, because there's, there's a narrative there um, that we hear often, which is this kind of idea that somebody's really ambitious and then they have this 
really ambitious idea that th they're going to target and they're, they're going to strive for it and they're going to pull out all the stops and they're not going to give up and every obstacle they'll overcome. And this is like an archetype or something that we just like re revere this type of person. But I think that's a myth and that that doesn't really exist. And that if you look at people like that, like the people we think worked like that, it's actually a slightly different story. It's actually that what was their genius? It wasn't that they had some crazy ambitious thing that was way far out that no one else knew how to do. It was rather that they noticed that the stepping stone that was necessary to get to that thing had suddenly snapped into focus. Um, and it's not necessarily because of them. Maybe other things had just come into place that suddenly enabled this thing to be possible that wasn't possible before. And then like the way I put it, it, it becomes only a stepping stone away. When something's just a stepping stone away, then you can set it as an objective. If it's just this little bit from where you are to where you need to get, then you can set an objective and get there. And it's a principal thing to do. But if it's not a stepping stone away, it's like many stepping stones. There are many discoveries on the chain that will eventually lead to this amazing thing. Then I think there's no one that has the vision to do that. That's, that's just impossible. Um, and that's a myth. And so what visionaries are is really people who see stepping stones before other people realize that they're there um, and then then follow that path it's like you can look at all kinds of amazing things like 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 the wright brothers or something like or edison and just ask yourself if that could have happened 100 years earlier with the same person whatever that would mean um, the stepping stones weren't there it's because of the stepping stones that was possible the genius was that they saw that that all had snapped into focus so but what's really enabling it to happen over time like all of these discoveries is the discovery of the stepping stones. And those are being discovered, it's really fascinating, for reasons that are completely orthogonal to the final discovery. Like, you know, I always talk about vacuum tubes leading to computers, like vacuum tubes were used in the first computers, but the, the, the people who discovered, so to speak, vacuum tubes, they weren't thinking about computation or computers or anything like that. They were thinking about completely different things, electrical experiments and stuff like that. But that happened to be a stepping stone that would be useful later for something else. And this is always the story. Um, it's, it's almost never the case that people create the stepping stones explicitly for that final thing that we never would have imagined being possible. Well, I remember in, um, in like fourth year undergraduate physics, I had a, a prof who, who was fond of telling us that for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, I mean, certainly for decades and decades, Romanian geometry was being studied by mathematicians for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Why would you need to imagine a universe that was non-Euclidean, where the angles of a triangle don't add up to 180 degrees? Like, I don't even know what that is. And then, you know, lo and behold, in the, the early 1900s, Albert Einstein goes, hey, I can use this to build out a theory of gravity. The, the pieces were there, and there was no reason to build those, those stepping stones other than sheer interest. And, and that kind of seems yeah. like a... Yeah, I mean, this illustrates why interestingness is so important. Um, it's mm. it and it it doesn't get the 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 respect it deserves, you know, because like it was very important that those people thought that that kind of mathematics was interesting, for for something hundreds of years later, and what it's still what what's really interesting and, and still remains kind of mysterious is, is how did they have that instinct or why did they have the instinct about that to keep that going for long enough to develop that to maturity. Um, without knowing that it might lead to something incredibly revolutionary down the road. And people just do that all the time. But what we should, I think, spend a little more time on is thinking about the, the reasoning for why they invest in those things independently of where it may lead. Like, that's what's interesting. That what sort of explains why these stepping stones are being laid. And in a lot of our institutions, I think, that are meant to foster innovation um, suffer because of ignoring this question. You know, like I, I remember because I was a professor for a long time, like the National Science Foundation is just an example, but you know, that's where a lot of scientists will apply to, to get grants and basically funding for research. Um, and other funding agencies are similar. And there's almost no chance that you could actually ask for money by just saying something's interesting. It's like, I'm, gonna st I'm not gonna tell you what, like basically they wanna know like what, what exactly are the impacts? They even have these, these terms like the broader impacts. Um, what are the impacts of what you're going to do? And, and so you're supposed to predict what's going to happen. And it's like, I could never just write, well, there's, there is no real impact that I know of, except it's just really interesting. Now I could, I could go on though, about why it's interesting. Like there are reasons that, I mean, I, someone who's studying some branch of mathematics could tell you why that's interesting, but what they can't tell you is what it's going to allow us to discover a hundred years later. 
but no one lets you do that. You, that's not considered a legitimate form of justification for doing a project. It's just, it's interesting. Um, and that I think is, is a mistake and a shame. And it's one of the reasons that we wrote the book um, is because I was, I was hoping to nudge discussion a little bit towards grappling with this issue that, that like everything should not be driven by its objective value. And we have to actually grapple with the, the notion of interestingness is the reason that we get stepping stones that lead to things that are amazing in the future. Well, and, and to your point about, about institutions that have the incentives to kind of prevent, that, that prevent us from seeing a little bit beyond this model, you, know, you, you think about the institutions that are exceptionally competent and well incentivized to do this i'm thinking here about y combinator in in uh, silicon valley so like when we like my company went through yc one of the things that they ingrained in us was this idea that like they're selecting for founders they're not selecting for ideas in other words they're selecting for explorers they're looking for people who are like interested broadly in things and famously the story of airbnb starts with you know two co-founders who are selling like obama o's branded cereal at some democratic national convention with like no plan like they they have air mattresses on beds that's their model and and yc hated the idea but they love the founders and the exploration is what matters it seems like you know there might be a mapping there that's a that is a great connection i it is true actually that like in in the whole world of like institutions that deal with ideas and advancing them or you could think of as gatekeepers like people who decide where funds are going to go what projects are going to go forward what won't what will get funded what will be supported um in, investors are this are, are, are a very unique example like investors in in, in uh, you know venture capitalists and things like that that they they actually do operate a little bit like what I'm describing like maybe more than these fund funding agencies because of like what you said like oh well we, we actually like the founders like I don't we don't actually know what they're gonna because we don't even like their idea okay that that seems like an extreme example but it's pretty interesting actually um, and I think the reason that that you see it in that world, something that's a little bit more conforming maybe maybe to, to this philosophy that, that I'm trying to, to advocate, I guess, is, is because, because of the idea of a portfolio, I think. It's like you, they, they I think, kind of explicitly believe that like that most bets aren't going to pay off, so it's okay. Yeah. Um, like we don't, we, we basically just need one big payoff. Um, so we can, we can try some things because they're interesting. Um, and it's very hard to predict what's going to pay off. Um, but it, but all the ones that fail don't matter as long as something big happens. And this is something we have to recognize. Like when I say we should pursue the interesting or there should be more institutional support for the interesting, it includes this acceptance that most things are going to fail. Like there's always a trade-off. So like the thing about objectives that's comforting is that like you can assess to some extent how realistic they are. And then generally that's what leads to mediocrity because most of the things that are like very likely to succeed are not that, that exciting. That's why they're likely to succeed. They're not that risky. So in terms of risk mitigation, like you get that from objectives mm -hmm. and you can mitigate risk and it's much easier. Um, if you're pursuing interestingness, then you're in, intrinsically embracing risk. And, um, and that makes people uncomfortable. Um, and so, so you have to though, because, so if you're gonna be an explorer, like a creator, like you're going to be taking risks. It's not a guarantee. It's not like, like I'm not trying to advocate like, you're going to have a great successful life if you just do things that are interesting to you. Like that's not a guarantee. You're taking risks. Like you would have to accept the fact that you're taking risks. And I would have full respect for somebody who chose not to do that because it's, they don't want to take a risk. But as long as you're aware of it, then it's a totally principled thing to do because the greatest discoveries will come from that kind of stuff. And so investors, it's interesting that they do, they do seem to, at some level, um, they may not say it the way I would say it, but I think they at some level do operate in this way, some of them at least, and because of this kind of portfolio view. And I think that's what generally creators also are like, even if they don't think about it explicitly that way is, you know, they got lots of ideas and some are gonna pan out, some are. I don't know why I'm even pursuing half the ideas I'm pursuing, but they're just interesting to me. Um, if I have enough freedom, I, I would do that. And um, it's a little bit like an investor with a portfolio. Yeah, it's, so I think you know for, for listeners, if you if you haven't read the book, if, I recommend you you read it. But I think one of the, the key things here is just the breadth of the the impact of this philosophy, this kind of change of of mindset. Um, it really does impact all these different spaces. I mean, you could start looking at even centrally planned versus not centrally planned economies through this lens. You could, you could start to look at, at a whole bunch of different things. Um, but having established the the reach of this this perspective, 
I'd like to narrow things down a little bit, start looking more quantitatively at how we define interesting. Because now we're, you know, we're saying, okay, interesting is good. We don't want to have fixed objectives because they're limiting in various ways. So what is interesting to say an AI algorithm? Right, right. And that, that starts to be important, of course, if you're, if you're writing an algorithm, it's like force you to formalize things. That's kind of what's, I guess, um, attractive about AI is like, you, you can't just talk about stuff. You actually have to make it work. Um, and so it, it, it has to be acknowledged that like when you get to machine learning and talking about interestingness, like, like this is a very, very slippery, uh, tricky concept to capture. Um, interestingness is, is deep. It's a deep question. It's actually, it's bordering on philosophy, probably is philosophy. Like what is interestingness? Um, and I actually find that uh, like a lot of my conversations in research, like actual, like trying to be, you know, like productive and, and getting somewhere with, with like building something end up somehow ending up in philosophy because of this. Like if you really sort of have a long, deep conversation with, with a colleague or something, eventually I'm talking philosophy of what is interesting is it happens so often. Um, and so at the moment, I'd say we don't really, we don't have a final answer to how to formalize interestingness. If we did, uh, that would be amazing. We would use that for sure because we would, we would literally have um, some kind of artifact, which are a machine that literally would be able to tell you how interesting anything is that you think of or that it thinks of. And that which would tell you which AGI itself. Yeah. Which is that's, yeah, that's kind of where I was going. It's, it gets to be almost AGI complete. Like the ability to do that, like is intelligence in some sense. So it's a little bit circular. Like if that's the way we're going to get to intelligence, well, then how can we use it to get to intelligence? We need to get to the intelligence first. So with that, with that paradox, there's still things you can do though, because we can, we, we can, and we are, I think, kind of breaking down interestingness into parts where some of them can be grappled with, even though some of them have to be deferred because they're like AGI complete. And the nice thing about it, I think, is that you can make progress, even if you don't have like a perfect pristine definition of interestingness. As you approach it, things get more interesting. I mean, that's kind of how it is. So, so, so that's cool because like, as things get more interesting, you get more powerful and more interesting results. Um, and so part of it, like the easy part, I think is novelty, which is what I spent a lot of time on um, like a few years back um, that like interestingness is multifaceted, but this facet of it is pretty clear. It's like basically everything that's interesting is also novel. Now it's not true the other way. It's not true that everything that's novel is interesting. So that's a problem. That's why it's not, it's just a proxy. It's not actually the full story, but it gets you pretty far. Like it, as long, if you had a way of knowing that something is novel, um, you're, you're doing something that approximates interestingness, but it's not quite as great as real interestingness. Um, and, and so we, there's, and even novelty is, 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 you can get into a philosophical discussion of what that is too. Um, because it has to be defined with respect to any given domain, but you can. So at least you can do that. Like you can say, here's a vector that characterizes this particular kind of artifact. And then once I define that, like these are the variables that get the height width, the mass or something like that, then I can compare that to some other like height width, width mass of some other artifact and say how different they are. And that's like a novelty measure. Now, the problem is, should it be height width and mass? I mean, like for humans, that's not a good, like, you know, is the main difference between me and you is that uh, like our height, width, and mass? I would say no. Like, there's, there's more interesting things to talk about than just that. So that's the problem: is that even with novelty, you have to start getting kind of into those minutia. Um, but at least you can grapple with it, and you can define it for a given domain. And for some domains, it's not hard at all. Um, and so you can start to see um, algorithms that will go for novelty. Um, and these are really different than algorithms that that, that aim for a specific target objective, uh, because they diverge. And divergence is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, like generally going for an objective causes convergence, like you're moving towards something and you may plateau too early and then you're stuck or you may get to it, but then you're also, you're not necessarily stuck, but it's over. You're not going to do anything else, but divergence isn't like that. Divergence can go forever. Um, and divergence is like, as soon as you find something that's interesting, there's just more to find and you're going to jump off of that and get something else. And so novelty is enough to get really divergent phenomena. And so we can start to see what things like this look like, but it's true that like to really get uh, continuing progress, like open-ended progress, we have to go beyond just novelty. Um, and that gets into, I think, a notion of also quality uh, as well. And okay, so I, I wanna ask how you can measure quality too, but I'd also, 
be curious for, for any examples you can give that are sort of concrete applications of, of these principles in action, like a, a specific machine learning problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, one a classic one that I liked to show from Novelty Search, which was Novelty Search was the algorithm that, that Joel Lehman and I developed when, when we first started recognizing these principles. Um, we were we we actually discovered these principles in, in in some other experiments when we weren't expecting them. So we discovered these principles, and we were really excited about these things. Um, but before the novelty search algorithm, we just realized this is like probably has profound implications and trying to formulate them into an algorithm, and then, then that turned into novelty search. And then um, with novelty search, one of the experiments we did was with a, a, trying to get a robot to learn how to walk, which at the time was like a kind of a classic problem in reinforcement learning, like just getting a robot to walk, usually a simulated robot. Sometimes people use real robots. We did it with a simulated robot, like in a simulated physics. Um, it was like a biped robot uh, and it had no arms uh, or head. It had a little tiny torso and two legs. And that was intentional because it's actually really harder to walk when you don't have arms and when you're a little torso, it's very hard to balance. So it made it a little bit hard. And to, can this thing learn to balance and walk? Um, and so the conventional thing to do would be to say, well, the farther that it goes, um, the higher the reward. And then we're going to follow that reward gradient towards longer and longer walking. And, and it'll get better at walking over time. And that's an objectively, objectively driven optimization. Um, but the novelty search approach was, let's just reward it if it does something different than it's done before. Um, and so we had to define different. So it's like, what does different mean? Like different could be, oh, if you fell on your face, but you fell in a different direction than you've ever fallen before, or, a or you had a different gait when you fell. Like we, we can look at the, the pattern of footsteps that you took. Um, and, and so I don't care if you, you don't, you're not even walking as long as you do something novel. Hmm. Now this is counterintuitive. Like if you think like at first, it seems like this is actually a really bad approach. Like it's like, well, what? It's just gonna do random crap. Like what is the point of this? It doesn't even know it's trying to walk. Like there's nothing in the reward that says walking is good. Mm -hmm. Now you've got this, this other alternative here that says like the farther you walk, the better you are. So this seems to be like the right thing to do. Like it's very intuitive, um, but it, it turns out it's not true. Um, it's the opposite. Like the thing that doesn't know what it's trying to do, the thing which is rewarded just for doing something new, turns out to produce ultimately a much better walker, a much better walking gait than the thing that's being rewarded for walking farther. Um, and so this is an example. So it's using novelty search, it's trying to do novel things and it ends up walking much farther. Um, and and yes, yeah, so this is an experience documented in the does, first novelty search paper. Does it produce then a whole bunch of other artifacts as well? Like I imagine that because of the divergence, you get agents that do completely wild and different things that have- uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, you will get you will get more diversity too, which I, I would also consider a nice fringe benefit as well. And maybe actually that's, in some sense, that should really be the star of the show. Like that's really what the conversation would be. But because we are, we are in our culture, the culture of machine learning and just general culture, Western culture is so objectively driven. We just want to talk about whether it learned to walk. So that's really, that, that's sort of like necessary to get the conversation started. Um, like, you know, in terms of like, how do you publish the paper? So how did they learn to walk and learn to walk? But that's really not the, the whole point of novelty search or something like that. It's more the divergent process. So that's really the interesting part. But it's still important, I think, because we do care so much about the objective here, like yeah. to acknowledge that there's something messed up about the way we're thinking, because it is an embarrassment. Like, I don't look at it as much as, wow, novelty search is like spectacular. It got this robot to learn to walk. Everything should be novelty search. Like, this is sort of like normal machine learning narrative. Like, my algorithm is better than your algorithm. Let's all use this one instead. Um, I don't think that's the narrative that I would take from the fact that novelty search is producing the better walker. Rather, I would focus more on the on the objectively driven algorithm and wonder why it's so embarrassing. Um, like mm. in some sense, this is an illustration of how misleading objective intuitions are. That like something that's literally being rewarded for getting better at what you want it to do can't even do well against something that doesn't even know what it's trying to do. I mean, that needs we need to dig into that, like why that's happening because it suggests there's something fundamentally wrong with our intuitions about objective driven search. There's also something almost, cause you know, I was thinking if, if you imagine a situation where you use this divergent kind of exploratory interest based novelty based strategy, and you find that a large fraction of your agents actually learn to walk in that context, like through that framing, it's almost something creepy about that in the sense that it implies that, that this environment itself 
somehow the environment combined with the agent together imply an activity or they imply a preference towards a certain behavior, which immediately, I mean, has me thinking existential thoughts about what the universe then implies and what the universe is optimizing for. Yeah, a really interesting points. Um, and I think it illustrates what is just so amazing about novelty. Like when you think about it, like novelty, it doesn't sound that amazing. We know what novelty is. Um, but if you really think about novelty, and we argue in, in the book that what it really is about it is information accumulation. Um, and like what we should really ask is, well, why would it learn to walk if I'm just telling it to do novel things? And this is like, I think a really fascinating topic that like the problem is that if, if I really put you in a situation where the only way for you to continue is to continue to do novel things, you are going to have to learn about the universe. That's what's really mm -hmm. fascinating about this. You know, because like if I, if I put you in a room and there's four walls and you know, you're trying to do novel things, like you can bump into all the walls, you can jump up and hit the ceiling. Like there's lots of things you can do, but eventually you're gonna run out of things to do. Like you're gonna have to learn how to open the door and get out of the room eventually if you're gonna keep doing novel things. Or if you stay in a box, you're going to be in a box. And that doesn't work with novelty search. But eventually, like if you really think about this in the limit, you're going to have to get off the planet. Um, like you're going to run out of things like yeah. eventually in the extreme. In fact, we have gotten off the planet. Like, in fact, like there's something novelty search like going on in the universe. And this is about the intrinsic properties of the universe that the universe is learning about itself um, through a divergent process. And evolution was the beginning of that. Evolution is evolution on earth, not genetic algorithms, but evolution itself, like natural evolution is a very, is a divergent process. It's not an objective convergent process. Um, and so it is displaying also this, this information accumulation property, or I guess all divergent processes have this property. And what happens is that you have to learn about the universe to continue to produce novel things. Um, and so like, if you're in a body, like a biped robot, you're gonna to have to learn how to walk. Like you cannot continue to do things that are that are novel if you can't walk. There's a, for a while you can, but you're gonna run out of things if you're just lying on the ground and falling on your face. And so you have to do that like to get off the ground and eventually you're gonna to have to go to Mars. Um, and so, and so what, when that's happening, you're actually, you're learning about the properties of your body. You're learning about the properties of physics, like in an implicit sense. It's not like the, the biped could literally tell us about physics, but implicitly it's learning about how physics works with respect to its morphology. Um, and I think it's also explains why we know so much about the universe. Like we know what the planets are in our solar system. We even know how to get to some of them. Um, and and it's because there's a divergent process underneath all of this. Like we are just part of that process and we ourselves are divergent because we are creative and we are open-ended and we explore. And so we are going to accumulate knowledge over time. It's inevitable. Um, if, you, if I think about like all of living nature, you can, you can think of all these diverse creatures, but in some way it's like an encyclopedia of all of the things that you can do in physics. So mm -hmm. it's an information accumulation. It's like you can do photosynthesis. That's a way of converting light into, into energy. Um, and you can, you, can, you can fly, like that's a possibility in, in this universe um, because of the physical properties of gravity and, 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 and atmosphere and things like that. And so these, if you look at all of the animal kingdom that way, then you're looking at, um, yeah, a kind of, a kind of um, encyclopedia of how the unit, what is possible and how physics works and what things can be done. And so I think the way to think about why it's so amazing is as uh, divergent processes or is, is because they're information accumulators. One of the things I, I really love about that is it's basically, I think it's maybe the only framing I've ever heard that unifies the sort of the different steps of cosmic history seen through a learning lens. So people often talk about, you know, you, like you said, the you know, moving from the, this clump of, of atoms that are inanimate to early biological life, multicellular life, now human beings, and we run a lot of our computations sort of in our heads, so we don't rely on evolutionary time. We can learn sort of in lifetime. And then potentially AGI as well, handing off more and more of that computation to the sort of self-improving system and, and you know, whatever takeoff scenario. Yeah, and yeah. It, it kind of seems, yeah, like, like, that, like a unifying theme for all three of those stages of, of learning. Yeah, yeah, I, I do think of it as a unifying theme. I've been thinking about this more recently, like just how, like I've sometimes I've thought about like evolution as a particular process and then like civilization as a particular process. Like once you get human intelligence, you get this civilization process, which is also divergent. Um, maybe in some way, not surprisingly, um, in open-ended, but, but it's riding on top of intelligence. 
and maybe you can even think about the phase before evolution, like whatever just like organically is happening with physical processes in the universe. Um, but, but actually, yeah, it is interesting to think of it all, all as a single continuum, like a giant um, divergent continuum, because that's true. Evolution actually is what, what produces intelligence. So it's just part of a long continuum of divergence, which is, which is intrinsic in the, somehow the fabric of the universe is that it's di divergent. Um, and that seems to be part of the explanation for why it's so amazing. It, it also has, has you think about human reasoning and, and sort of goal setting in a very different way, at least like I, I used to think of, um, I used to think of myself as having terminal goals. So I, I would tell myself, you know, when I'm really old, here's where I want to be. That classic question, where do you want to be when you're not in 10 years, but when you're about to die or something like that. And what this has, at least has me do is kind of think back to that line of thinking and say, well, wait a minute, maybe none of my goals are actually terminal. Maybe they're all instrumental. Maybe everything that's going on is just instrumental goals all the way down. I'm in a situation, I look around, I'm doing a bunch of exploration, and then I, I pick a thing in the Thomas Edison light bulb sense. Yeah, yeah. You can think of this kind of divergent thinking as sort of like opportunism. It's just like you've got you've got this portfolio, I guess you could say, or, or you've got an archive of like ideas in your head. And you just opportunity opportunistically choose to follow paths because they look interesting right now. Um, and, and it's very important to be opportunistic if you want to be divergent. Um, because because you're not thinking about where you're gonna go, like when you're old and when you're like at the end of life and you don't have to think about that. You just think well, opportunistically right now. So it's more of a say, rather what we tend to do is we evaluate where we are compared to where we want to go. Like that's what we're taught. That's a cultural thing, but rather you could evaluate um, where you are um, with respect to where you've been. And so that can tell you, that can tell you something about like whether if you continue in that direction, it might continue to be interesting. Um, so that's basically like a measure of novelty. It's like, what is the trajectory that I'm going down? Not where it leads, but how are things changing? And is it changing in an interesting way? And that's just opportunistic thinking. Um, and so, yeah, I often, so it's like a, the ability to be flexible minded and say, well, I was going to do this, but actually now I see that there's an opportunity to do that. Um, and it's true that people who do that, like tend, tend to be the ones who are successful. It doesn't mean that all people who do that are successful, but the people who are extremely successful probably did do that at some point, like they were able to pivot. Um, and so, yeah, yeah I, I think that's, 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 that's interesting to think about also. Yeah. Well, I guess it, it ties in as well to like kind of this, this utopic dystopic uh, dichotomy where when I think about most dystopias, what they seem to have in common is this um, abandonment of novelty for individuals, like novel, novelty of individual experience. You know, if you go to Star Trek, what are the Borg? They're people who live extremely predictable lives. Um, th there's, you know, a fear of like, what is a dictatorship? It's a, it's a universe that imposes kind of monotony on, on different people. Um, even, you know, a lot of, if you think about the future state of humanity, people get stuck in a simulation. What makes that scary? Well, it's the potential of kind of having a finite bound on the novelty you could experience. You're within these walls. Yeah, yeah. It, there's 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 a straitjacket like quality yeah. to like I guess it's kind of a social control, um, and and we we I believe and the book does touch on this like that we, uh, you know, do experience this to some extent even now even though we're not living in dystopia right now, um, but but we do experience like this kind of this kind of um, suffocating um, kind of. Um, yeah, straitjacket that that is that is imposed on us about like how you're the kind of trajectory you're supposed to take, um, starting with yeah something like kindergarten or maybe before that, um, but it's very objectively driven. Like every stage has been mapped out for you and what you should do in those stages uh, to follow the line towards your objective, which which has been defined for you in some ways. Not every way, obviously you choose your career and things like that. But it's like there's certain things you're supposed to learn and there's certain time you're supposed to learn them by and so forth. And and this goes on for decades. Um, and then you're supposed to do certain things like get a career at a certain age and this, so forth and get married and all this. I mean, I'm not saying all this is bad. I'm not saying I'm not trying to condemn all of like the way society works and not against everything. Uh, but what I do think is, is, is problematic is that we are, we, we, we have a, an intuitive sense that something is wrong. Like for us, like this is a psychological issue. We don't like that being imposed on us because we love freedom. I believe people want, they both want freedom and self-expression and, and these kinds of forces work against that. And so I think in that there's something really appealing about this message from, a, from this more kind of human perspective, which is one of the reasons also we wrote the book, like this is very algorithmically motivated. So it's really weird. Like it's not about yeah. 
person, people. It's more about AI algorithms. But we, I started to realize because actually I was giving a lot of talks about this um, as as interest in it was growing um, in the in the machine learning community and computer science in general. I started to realize that, that like a lot of the conversations I was having were not actually about algorithms. Like mm-hmm. people were wondering, what does this mean for me? Um, what does it mean for people? Uh, what does it mean for a society and things like that? And some of them were like cathartic. I had some really interesting, like there were people in um, one of like the one of the most influential experiences for me was when I spoke at the Rhode Island School of Design um, to like all these artists there, you know, this is like a, like an art school. Um, and I talked about the, um, like some of these results about like how sometimes it's better not to be, not to know where you're going and just to do things because they're interesting. And, and they were so moved by that, like, because like in, in that, I didn't, hadn't thought about it before, but like in their context, um, they, one of their biggest challenges, they can't justify what they're doing mm-hmm. um, to people like their parents or their teachers. Like, why are, why are you doing, like, what exactly is your career goal here? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, th- and there's some extreme examples of that. Like there was some guy who liked to um, put a piece of metal in the ocean and um, well, first he'd hack it up with a with an axe and then put it in the ocean and let it rust, like and then like let it rust overnight. Um, and it's like, what is the point of that? Like, I don't, I don't know what objectively that is accomplishing at all. And and he was grappling with this. Like, he doesn't really he can't justify like why he's doing. He's the world's expert on doing that, but he can't explain to anybody why he should be doing that. Um, but this gives you an out because it basically says, well, but that is interesting in some way. It doesn't matter what it leads to. It just is interesting intrinsically. And maybe not to you, but to some people, to him, obviously. Um, and I can see why it's interesting because it, it, does, it does sort of evoke like these notions of like, um, it's sort of like beauty and the destruction and the decay and maybe recovery. Like there's some metaphorical aspect to it. it is that important? I, don't, I mean, I don't, not objectively, I don't know, but it's just interesting. Um, and so there, you can start to justify doing these kinds of things. But the thing that I think you have to also keep in mind is that, while from this kind of personal philosophy point of view, it, it may be liberating. I believe it is like to think like this it makes you feel better about yourself. If you don't know why you're doing it's like, I chose some career path just because I felt good about it. Or like my parents want me to be a doctor, but I'm learning the guitar. Okay. So maybe I can make you feel better about that, but you do have to keep in mind that that comes with this provision that like, you're going to be taking risk. Mm-hmm. So like the trade-off is like, like all of these, all of these prescribed paths that society might lay out for you, are providing some measure of safety. Like if you do rebel against them and just be like, well, I'm just going to be opportunistic and do a divergent search. I mean, good luck. Like you, you might actually turn out doing well, but, but you have to understand that that is very risky. And, and so that's a trade-off. Like if you're willing to be divergent, then you have to be willing to take risks and, and you might have a great time or you might have a horrible time when things don't work out. Yeah, everybody's got to choose their choose their mean and choose their variance uh, of outcomes that they're willing to to live with. And it, it's funny, you know, not to, not to circle back to that Y Combinator thing again, but that's something that they explicitly flagged was like, hey, we have a lot of founders here who find it difficult to justify what they do with their lives to their parents. And I remember talking to uh, Michael Seibel, who now uh, runs YC, and he was saying like, yeah, so a large part of our value and function is to like be this very flashy organization that gives you a big certificate that says, hey, you're in. Now you can tell your parents you have a big Silicon Valley investor backing whatever harebrained scheme you're up to. And that just like that validation is what a lot of people need to get to build it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's I like the connection. The Y Combinator point is really interesting. Um, it's like they, yeah, they, they have some some seeds of this philosophy with, without probably they've probably never never seen the book or talked to anybody that that I know, but um, they 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 just intrinsically seem to seem to share some of this philosophy. You'd expect like well incentivized systems too to kind of converge on that way of thinking in the limit. You know, the thing that's most productive is going to be discovered over time as at a meta level, like organizations explore this space. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that. Um, like it isn't more widespread, like in, in like these kind of, um, I guess, um, powerful professional circles that you don't see an embrace of, of this kind of thinking. Like it's more like what, what you do see, I think is mostly risk mitigation. Um, like lots of bureaucratic steps that try to like prevent something bad from happening. Um, and those tend to proliferate, like the larger an organization gets, the older it gets, the more risk mitigation you get. And then the less of this you get, the less of kind of divergence and opportunism and taking risks and things like that. Um, and so I, I know like in, 
in the in in this in the industrial world and the corporate world like this is an issue of course is to, to keep lean and the ability to, to be innovative obviously is a big problem um but but why don't we see yeah why don't we see more of this y combinator philosophy and why so much of the security blanket of objectives like the security blanket of objectives is be very clear what you're trying to do like write it all out like do your okrs yeah so that like we have an exact accountability and accountability is a word that comes constantly accountability yeah, we yeah, need yeah, to be yeah. accountable so that we can know if you're taking too much risk like then we know things aren't going well um and and so we're also paranoid about like maybe going down the wrong path that we can't take the risk of going down like a, a novel path or an interesting path it just becomes pruned out and so why is this like why is this a cultural phenomenon I mean, I can understand it in some some places that you can't afford to do it, and, and there's other places where it's not worth doing it. Like, not every organization was founded to to be innovative. Like, that's something to consider. Yeah, I actually I do wonder if it might have something to do with like the geometry of the the landscape of value. So, um, you know, in startups, you talk about product market fit a lot. This magical moment when you know you have a product, all of a sudden people want it, and you've gone you've crossed this chasm from building pure crap to now you know, the spark of magic has happened. And this is usually a very abrupt transition, partly because the peaks in product space are super narrow. Like you can take a Tesla and you subtract one thing, like one wheel, and now this is a useless piece of crap nobody wants. Um, that might seem like a big thing to remove, but in product space, that is one increment. So like in, in all these different ways, you have this incredibly narrow peak and finding that peak is such a precious thing. In order to find it, you need to be exploratory. You need to be looking for novelty and, and kind of be innocent and open-ended in that way. But then the moment you find it, it's like, oh my God, we gotta protect this. And then this whole business ossifies around preventing any one person from nudging you off that peak. And then you have people looking at these big businesses and don't realize that they're selecting on the ones that have already found product market fit. And they're going, oh, look at that. Google has a ton of OKRs. We should have OKRs too. And then all of a sudden you, you lose your novelty. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's situational, like what's really appropriate. Like, like you have to be realistic. And and so so even though like like I'm going around talking about how bad objectives are, like I I I acknowledge in some situations it does make sense. Like when you found that peak and you're on that peak, especially if you're alone on that peak, okay, you can you can do this kind of like hyper optimization and just like ex extremely uh, search around that peak. And that's different than what I'm talking about. It's true that in the long run you're taking another kind of risk because you're myopic and like you might be missing something and eventually somebody will find a different peak that's even better than yours. And that happens all the time. And that's what you see like, like mm. these, like eventually what people call disruption. Um, but for a while it makes sense and it, it can make sense. Um, instead of just, I mean, it might be crazy like to go like, let's go find another peak when we just found their peak. Yeah. Um, but, but, but still, um, yeah, like I think what the problem is that we, we don't, we don't actually think of these things in a principled way. So, so people are doing this instinctually. So it's like, we'll just do, because it's the right thing to do, we do these, all these, these risk mitigations and accountability and stuff like that. And you create massive bureaucratic processes. And it didn't run a thinking about what the, the, the risk reward ratio is here or like what we need to do to get innovation. We're just doing it because like, well, it seems like that's like a really principled thing to do. Like that's what we do in, in like, like real serious organizations. And that is a mistake. I think you need to be able to understand, or it's maybe it's that that's the easy thing to do. Like it's actually, we understand those principles. We understand accountability. We understand measurement, like moving towards a goal and knowing how far we're moving, being accurate in our measurements. Like there's like tons of stuff written about this. People understand this. So you get it all over the place. It's like, just like proliferating like a virus. But the thing that you don't get is, is this more kind of divergent type of process. And so I'm acknowledging it's not appropriate in all cases, but the problem is that where it is appropriate, nobody really grapples with it or thinks about it or understands it. Um, and so you get, I think you get an imbalance, like the pendulum swings way towards the objective yeah. type of thinking. And, and we're missing opportunities, especially in, in, in institutions meant to foster innovation, which includes some companies that have parts that are supposed to foster innovation, like research labs inside certain companies um, still operate like objectively driven types of organizations. Not all, I mean, I'm not saying all, and obviously there's exceptions, but a lot do. And so we do, I think, end up with a somewhat distorted, like perverted system overall. I and mean, even though we have to acknowledge that sometimes being objectively driven is okay, just the pendulum has swung too far. Yeah, it does seem like it's this vast space that's basically untouched at this point, just because objectives are conceptually also, it feel, they feel a little easier to grapple with and there's less 
yeah, as you said, culturally, there's less guilt associated with executing against an objective. You can just point to something and say number go up, and your argument is pretty well done. Um, but so in terms of like kind of moving back into the AI, um, the AI kind of algorithm side of this, one type of conversation that I've had a lot on the podcast is with people focused on AI safety and alignment, especially as we start to look at more powerful systems. And one of the things I've wondered about in this context is, does open-endedness make alignment more difficult? Because essentially we have an agent that is much more unpredictable in some ways, um, that doesn't have a well-defined objective that we can talk about. I mean, it's hard enough when you've got a well-defined objective, uh, or, or is there a reason why this might even make it easier? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So on the face of it, it makes things more difficult. I think that's pretty clear because you're, you're talking about systems that are going to do things that surprise us almost by definition. Like that's the whole point. If we knew what it's going to do, then it must not be open-ended. Um, so that's, that could be, that could be a, a, a safety issue clearly. But if you think about this a little more deeply, like you've got to go one step beyond that. This is not a bad thing, um, even from a perspective of being very concerned about the long-term safety with respect to artificial intelligence. Because if you think about it, if we ever do get to AGI, it is going to be open-ended. There's nothing we can do about that. Like if it isn't open-ended, then it isn't AGI, or at least it's not human mm -hmm. level. Like if it's just a mechanical robot that just like, you know, you say, clean my floor, cleans your floor, that's not AGI. Um, and But if it actually can do the kinds of things we do, we have, there's going to be an implicit open-ended process, whether we like it or not. It's as smart as we are, probably more smart than we are. It's going to be creative. It's going to do things that we don't expect. So right now we don't have that, but what we do have are open-ended like algorithms that are aspiring towards open-endedness that are divergent. And this, I think the, the real way to think about it is that this illustrates why grappling with that now is very important because we're moving towards that. We're moving towards a world where open-ended processes are going to emerge inevitably because of the power of what we're creating. Um, and so understanding how to control open-ended processes from an algorithmic point of view is immediately central to understanding AI safety. Um, and it's actually, it sounds almost paradoxical to talk about controlling an open-ended process. Mm. Um, like the whole point of the process is that they aren't under control. Um, and this is, I think, central to what we have to grapple with, with AI safety, um, is that like, we need to understand how do, you, how do you find that very delicate balance between destroying all exploratory creativity and on the other hand, creating like a huge risk of going off into crazy land. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we have to believe and have some faith that there is, there is this kind of like needle threading middle ground there that you can achieve that, but it's very delicate and you have to understand the trade-offs between the two sides to understand how to control something to that extent. So it's basically an open-ended system with a constraint on it. Yeah. Um, and, and we have that, like, I mean, humans are open-ended and yet we put constraints on each other. You know, I mean, there are things like laws and like society has developed ways to constrain behavior yet without completely destroying the ability to be innovative. Um, and you do see like different variations on society that, that, that do sometimes destroy the ability to be innovative. Like in very authoritarian cultures, like, like you see less innovation, like it's not a surprise, but they've got lots of constraint. Um, but then like in, in the algorithmic sense, like if you try to do that, then, then you won't get like the full blossoming of, of what AGI could be. And so in, at a more modest level, like today, the thing that's interesting is we are, we are grappling with that on, on a much lower stakes level in open-ended algorithms, because the problem with open-ended algorithms is you want them to do things that are actually interesting to you. Mm. Um, and so like you can create a divergent algorithm that will go off into crazy land. Like it'll do all kinds of crazy things, but we don't want that. So we want to block that from happening and put a constraint on it. This is, I think, a metaphor for, for like the safety problem in general. It's that it's like in this particular microcosm right now, it's not really unsafe. It's just boring. And it's just like not appealing, but it's still very analogous to the larger problem that we're ultimately facing, which is we need to constrain it for safety reasons, but we don't want to kill its ability to be creative. And in the open-ended world, like that's the problem that we face in this microcosm right now that we want, we're not worried necessarily about like danger, but we are worrying about doing things that are pointless. And so once we try to put the, the blockers in to like stop it from doing things that are pointless, because we only want to stay on interesting paths, like what we face is this problem where it stops being open-ended. 
So it's like, yeah, it's constrained to things we know we care. Like you can see this in like architecture search. Like that's, I think a big place you see like in, in the search for neural network architectures. Like when you see progress there, you see highly constrained systems where it's almost like we already know what architectures are good yeah, from yeah. the beginning. So you throw those in as the ingredients and then you get out some, like it's like a slightly new parameterization of a convnet or something. I mean, okay, I, I think you, that's, that's good and it deserves to be published and stuff, but it's not as exciting as like inventing an entirely new paradigm. But the problem is if you don't put the constraints, yeah, it invents lots of new paradigms, but they're insane and they're useless yeah. and they're not going to do anything for it. So like the happy medium is super hard to find. And it's the same with the balance between creativity and safety, I think. And so I think by grappling with this now in this smaller scale kind of microcosm situation, it is allowing us to understand what the what the stakes are eventually, like when we actually come out into like really powerful systems that have the capacity to invent things that are dangerous. Um, and how do you actually control those while still not like destroying their ability to invent? And is this something that you think we can address effectively through, uh, through theory today without having sy systems that approach that level of capability? Or is this something that you know, maybe there are bits of it we can address today, little like obvious issues, but that we're going to have to wait uh, as we scale up to these these systems to really tackle. Um, I think I think we can make some progress today from a theory perspective, but but it but it there is some limit I think to that, like because yeah, it's it, the analogy only goes so far, um, and the stakes are are very different uh, today than like this this theoretical future, and and so and also I think like it's it there's probably no um, final like formal solution to this kind of balancing act. Um, like it's never gonna be perfect. And so like at the end of the day, um, like society plays a role. It's not just algorithmic. Um, right now I can just worry about the algorithm because like if, yeah, if I develop a neural network architecture that sucks, like it doesn't really matter, like nobody's getting hurt. Um, but in the long run, like somebody has, somebody will have to intervene like if things are going off the rails. And so checks and balances from a policy perspective are gonna be necessary um, no matter what you do algorithmically is my belief. Um, because like, while we can, we can do better at the balancing act, it just can't be perfect. Just like with people, like, I mean, there's nothing about us in particular that guarantees safety, like in what we do, yeah. we're pretty dangerous ourselves. And so we're constantly putting constraints on ourselves from, from like society institutional points of view um, to, to prevent disaster because lots of us could cause one. Yeah, and from an alignment standpoint, I guess we are a shining example of a total alignment failure on the part of our ancestors in the 1500s who would have wanted us to be wearing different clothes, have different sexual habits, eat different food. Oh, yeah. You know, this, it is clearly a problem that humans have not solved intergenerationally even. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point too, just how like our, our principles and and our ideals drift over time. And so like encoding human principles and, and, and ideals into, into an algorithm is, it's probably like, it's not the, the ultimate right way to think about like this problem. It's a much more sophisticated problem than just that. Like even that's a like really hard problem. Like how do I formalize what, it, what the you know, human ideals are? But it's not, that's actually simpler than the real problem because the truth is that this is going to be drifting. Mm. Um, and so like, we have to create like a system of checks and balances that can can move with the drift, um, and and we sort of have like at least we have some examples like that's what that's what our whole kind of like government institutional structure is like I'm not saying it's perfect or something, but it it's sort of about like allowing the drift to happen, but but also keeping some checks and balances so it doesn't go crazy, and so we sort of understand how how to build things like that, but now we're going to build one around something very new. It's not around ourselves now. It's around like crazily intelligent machines. So there's a lot that's not really known about how to do that or what that's like. But at least we have some idea. Like, like there is some precedent for doing things like that. So we'll have to do that, or we'll we'll have to not. It, well, I mean, basically, it's 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 when you talk about checks and balances, that the checks, like the things that stop it, are going to exist. There will be paths we can't go down. That might have been interesting, but we'll have to we'll have to stop them in their tracks because we just can't take the risk, and we will have to make those judgments. And there's nothing we can do about that. Like I don't think we can ever just say, "Oh, it's just perfect." Like just let it do whatever it does, and we we'll just like take our hands off. Um, we just we're just gonna have to case by case, like say, like is this is this worth taking this risk? And there will be probably some amazing things that AGI could have done that it never will, 
um, because we just can't risk to go down those those paths. That that seems very plausible and and, and very responsible as a view. Yeah. Um, as as we wrap up here, I mean, I, I'm, I'm we we go on forever, obviously here, but it is an open ended discussion. Um, I do want to ask you how your views have changed since writing the book, because in the intervening six, I think it's been six years. Uh, we've seen a whole bunch of stuff happen around open-endedness, around self-play, attention, uh, even scaling. So how, how have some of these things shaped your view on what open-endedness is, what the, the most exciting paths ahead might be? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I still, I think that the, the, the principles in the book from, like you said, six years ago still stand. So I still believe in these fundamental principles like that, like divergent search is, is very exciting and important in, in that we, we should be embracing it. And I think we are increasingly embracing it. Um, like, like you see, like more open-endedness teams popping up like a deep mind. Um, and I think this is great and a good thing. Um, and, and, and so like in that sense, I think I haven't shifted that much, but what, what I have shifted is um, I've seen, I've learned over the last six years, as, as many as us has some, some new things about uh, technologies and AI that I didn't realize. Um, and, and, and so, and, and that relates to things like what you can accomplish without being open-ended. I think I've been surprised in some ways um, that like, like particularly with what gradient descent can do, mm. um, like in terms of training, you know, multi-billion parameter structures to do things that are really challenging and and powerful um, through what, on the face of it, don't appear to be open-ended processes. Um, that 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 has forced some reckoning in terms of like maybe a, I would have been more pessimistic six years ago and being like, none of these things can really be created through through anything but an open-ended process. Um, cause I, I, believe that like certain things you have to be open-ended in order to achieve because of this sort of stepping stone paradox, which is that like the things that lead to where you want to go, don't always resemble where you want to go. In other words, like there are circuitous routes through the search space. And so the thing that leads to human intelligence may not look like human intelligence. And so because of this, like you need these stepping stone collector processes because they find stepping stones that would be ignored if we were only being objective. Like you would say, well, this thing is not any smarter than that thing, so we're gonna throw it away, but it actually might be the thing we need. And we come from, for example, like human beings come from originally flatworms and flatworms, um, you know, they wouldn't be winning any awards for intelligence. Um, like what distinguishes a flatworm from the other like creatures around during that historical era of evolution? It's not their intelligence. Um, it is things like bilateral symmetry, but who would predict that, okay, bilateral symmetry is important to getting to intelligence. It's just like impossible to see, but it's an essential stepping stone. And the reason it was preserved is because evolution is a divergent process and could care less whether it's going towards intelligence or not. So I would say six years ago, like essentially all these, all complex structures are going to be requiring some kind of open-ended process because the stepping stones are going to be circuitous. But then like when I see that you get like these huge neural networks being trained through what effectively aren't open-ended processes, like something like um, ImageNet and saw and getting really good scores on ImageNet, like that wasn't, that wasn't achieved through open-ended processes. Um, I started, I, I have to, to adjust some of my thinking and, and start to understand that um, when you know, when you do know um, the targets, like when you have actual training targets and you have sufficient data, like to, to exemplify the type of decisions that you're going to need to make. Apparently, it turns out in the last six years, you can actually, um, you can actually like, like just continue to move forward from an objective standpoint. Um, and so that there are exceptions, but there's still just specific types of situations. Like that's a cutout from the larger problem. Like the problems we don't have the data for the things we really want. That's the problem. Like, I guess if we did, we probably could do this through just pure optimization, but we don't have the data. Exploration is necessary. That's why reinforcement learning remains a hot field. And so I still believe like in the larger picture that, that the open-ended um, type of uh, um, overarching algorithm is going to be necessary. But, but in a smaller picture, I've had to adjust some beliefs because of like these, these, these really interesting achievements. But there's a question of whether generalization and creativity are actually aligned with each other. Because creativity is almost like getting outside the distribution on purpose. Right. Um, so I'm not sure that like getting more and more general within the distribution to which you've been exposed, like has a lot to do with creativity. But, but there is like, it gets really complicated because like if, if I'm exposed to creativity itself, 
So that, that's a, like really kind of a mind boggling thing. But so if I have lots of data on being creative, like does that, can I generalize creativity from that data? But the problem is that I think the, the problem is there isn't enough data on creativity, like true creativity, like because, because creative acts are very rare. Mm. And actually, um, even when we have data on them, we don't have the right kind of data, I think, because like what you really want to know is like the, the genesis of the ideas. It's not just what the ideas were, but like, where do they come from? How did they actually jump off from the previous stepping stones? That tends not to be documented in data. In fact, I don't even know if the people who did it could, could document it. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. do, do you even know what your thought process was? Like to some extent though, maybe, but it's just not documented, even if it could be to whatever extent it could be. And so, um, so it might not be the kind of thing that can be data driven, but then, then you might say, oh, well, we're screwed. Like the, because everything we're doing these days is also data driven. It's like, that's the Holy grail, but we can't be totally screwed because it happened. Like creativity exists, yeah. obviously. Um, and it's, it's, it is the result of an open-ended process. This is like a meta point because like the open-ended process itself was creative, like evolution is some like outer loop of evolution. The inner loop of human creativity is sort of an inner loop because we're like things created by evolution, but then we ourselves are create are creative. Um, well, that's a product of that outer loop. And so like there are, there are open-ended processes that lead to things that are creative that weren't data-driven. Um, and that may be, I believe, I still believe, so this is a non-adjusted belief from six years ago, that that is probably true, that to get to that level of like human-like creativity will ultimately require um, something that isn't objectively driven, but it can be combined with these very powerful objectively driven processes. So that's, that's like the new, the new, the new wrinkle in it is that like, these are clearly powerful things. Like, and so like that can, that probably is part of like the set of ingredients that, that we need to consider, but there's this other ingredient here, which is this open-ended divergent type of thing. And I still believe, yeah, that's part of it. If we're going to really get all the way. That's a really interesting integration of those those two big ideas there. Uh, thanks so much, Ken. I, I really appreciate it. This has been a, re a really fun conversation for me. I will just say, for anybody listening, the book is called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, The Myth of the Objective. I really recommend reading this book. Um, I think it's just, it's so fascinating. Ken has a bunch of talks where he presents some kind of concrete examples, one in particular that's very visual that I, I recommend uh, looking up to. So Ken, thanks so much for, for joining me for this. It's been a ton of fun. It was great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.